Before I get started with my talk, I just wanted to mention that um, there will be some possibly triggering content related to mental health, and I just wanted to say for anyone who may feel triggered or might want to step out, um, Reef Foster has the number of the Hong Kong counselor in case um, anybody wants that. So it'll be right outside. When I was 11 years old, my father died suddenly. His death exacerbated my journey with mental illness. My generalized anxiety disorder and depression symptoms quickly followed suit. After he died, I initially hid my symptoms as best I could because I felt my family had enough to deal with. But I was not handling my symptoms in a healthy way. By the end of elementary school, my symptoms were taking on life of their own. When I got to high school, my symptoms at times just became overwhelming. The most notable symptom was how any mention or thought or worry of anxiety for me provoked an anxiety spell. And it looked different and manifested in different ways. But one example was there were times where I would shift my entire outgoing personality by being completely silent after being able to talk nonstop the day before. My appetite became so scarce that even when I was hungry, I starved myself. The worst symptom was the constant expression of fear and sadness written all over my face. Now, no matter how much mental energy I put towards it, I could never hide it. And I wanted to hide it so bad because I didn't want anyone to ask me what was wrong. The final straw came in my dad's fifth year anniversary, where I developed insomnia due to overwhelming anxiety. As, actually, as I was actually trying to sleep, I was actually addressing a thought or concern that had come up from the day before. And as soon as I would address that one, it would split off and form another two worries or another couple worries that I would try to squash, but it was almost like trying to combat a mental hydra. After I found the right, felt, the right therapist, I was taught new approaches to tackle my symptoms. And this was the first moment that I felt I was able to control and name my illness. I had seen therapists before, but none of them really addressed the underlying issue or the anxiety. It was mainly just the problems that were occurring at the time. The best continuous support that I received throughout this time was from my family, even when I had no idea what was going on. My main point is that for a friend or family member, there are multiple approaches to mental illness treatment. Each mental illness is unique in its own way and it's important to find the right approach. Every person's DNA is specific enough that we all develop different genetic conditions and become different people as a result. Francis Collins discusses in his book, The Language of Life, how the important factor about personalized medicine is that it is an individual medicine. And while certain treatments may overlap, that not all of them will impact people in the same way. Some people might reject it, some people might not respond to it as well as others. And it's important to take that concept back to mental health as well, how that while there might be new mental health approaches, they're not all universal. In some cases, they differ based on previous medications, family health history, or even just down to personal habits, such as diet, exercise, or current relationship status. Mental health and physical health are essential for how we survive as human beings, but there's a fundamental lack of universal knowledge on mental health. If I could give an analogy, based on the amount of resources and just universal knowledge there is about mental and physical health, in a bike race, physical health will be winning the Tour de France, but mental health will be all the way back here, barely keeping up with the pack. Just as a way to kind of get an analogy for it. And when you look at the statistics in a global scale, these statistics become just honestly quite staggering. According to the Wealth Organ Health Organization, in 2014, 800,000 people committed suicide that year. That's quite a large number, but when you look at some of the statistics and the global uh, political priorities and mental health at the time, unfortunately it starts to make sense. In that same year, it was estimated that in 60 countries, there was less than one psychiatrist per 100,000 population of people. If that same statistic existed for medical doctors, for surgeons, there would be a large public campaign to address it. But to my knowledge, the first time I heard about this was when I was researching this talk three years later. 
More importantly, in, on the World Health Organization's page, uh, mental disorders affect one in four people. Current statistics show that in some countries, 40% have no mental health policy, 30% have no mental health program, and 25% have no mental health legislation. These statistics are important because it is important to see that in some places in the world, mental health is given the same regard as science was in the Middle Ages. And it's no wonder that at some times doctors cannot fully treat or understand the mental illnesses that are happening based on these priorities that are given. Mental illness was weaponized throughout history on vulnerable populations. Barbara Eibrick and Deirdre English wrote a book entitled For Our Own Good where they detailed how science was used to promote misogyny and undermine women healers throughout history. One example they give is how before doctors discovered that women had a menstruation cycle, doctors would just address the initial behaviors and write them off as effeminate madness. And they wouldn't actually try to address the actual problems that were happening, but rather just take all the problems at face value. Today, often mental illness is brought up in the aftermath of mass shootings. And when friends and neighbors of the shooter are interviewed, they always say something along these lines. They were so nice, I don't understand, or they never caused a fuss, they mainly just kept to themselves. This type, this belief puts mentally ill people in a more stigmatizing position because at times it can motivate them to hide their symptoms, or even worse, refuse to seek treatment. More importantly, in, uh, in some regards, it's important to understand that this fear that sometimes society places on mental illness can be very real for people. When you or a loved one has a mental illness, sometimes it seems that the symptoms completely take over their personality. But it is in that moment when it seems they're hiding their symptoms or you don't even recognize the person you're looking at, that is when they need you the most. In my experience, before I knew what anxiety was, when I was in the middle of an anxiety spell, I would allude it to similar as being thrown out into a snowstorm with no map and no sign of immediate help in sight. This fear is why it's so important to find the right approach and the right treatment for the people that you care about. Each mental illness, such as anxiety, depression, anorexia, bulimia, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, as well as many others, all present in different ways. While mental illness might initially present as anxiety, it can actually be a small sign of depression. Even mental health professionals can miss signs or misdiagnose because of a misinterpretation of initial symptoms. Multiple psychologists have told me that they couldn't detect when I was anxious. And that is why when you're approaching a friend's mental illness, it is important to approach it with an open mind. Because if you approach it with a biased opinion based on one or two biased observations, you can miss the majority of their symptoms because your brain has already decided that they have X illness and not take into account that there could be something else that's going on there. Most of you know someone who has a mental illness, and I can promise you that there are multiple ways to support them. Before I talk to a friend, I usually like to write down my thoughts on a piece of paper. Nothing specific, just a few reminders so I can keep my thoughts in check. I ensure it is in a private place, and I use the golden rule of, I will understand more if I listen. When you talk about a subject this personal, and you spend most of the time talking, you may as well have wasted the interaction because you're actually not getting enough information about what this person is actually experiencing or what they may exactly be going through. When you talk about a subject this personal, you want to talk about 10 to 15 percent of the time and listen to the rest so you can get a full idea of what's going on. It's also important that you don't push or rush your friend or family member to tell more than they feel comfortable or to push ideas about what you think they should do. Because some people just aren't ready to admit it to themselves, let alone to a friend, family member, or even a medical professional. Unfortunately, if you are concerned that they are inclined to self-harm or suicide, you might ultimately have to make decisions for them. But unless this is the case, you should always respect their wishes in that regard. 
But it's also important to know when you're out of your depth. If you feel that you are stumbling or that you just don't know what's going on, it's okay to consider maybe I should step aside. You should still check in with your friend and say, hey, I feel out of my depth here because of X reason. Can I talk to X person about this to find a good way to help you? Even though when you feel the need to step aside, it's completely natural and it's okay, but you still need to check in with your friend and make sure that it's okay with them because if they feel abandoned by you, that could also set them back. Which goes back, which goes to a golden rule that I personally take with mental illness is never abandon a friend in crisis, even when you have to step aside. You can always find ways to check in with them, even if they're talking to someone else. You can, for example, what some people have done is called a welfare check. You can make them promise to call you or to text you if they feel that their symptoms are coming back and they need someone just to talk to you about it. And that's, that's just something important to keep in mind. And again, these are just some approaches to mental illness. There are a multitude, but in my personal experience, these are things that I've found. There are certain realities about mental illness that we are going to have to accept in mental health. The first is its equitable place to physical health, even if in certain parts of the world people don't want to admit that. Ask any doctor and they will tell you that they need a patient's full mental health history before they decide an exact course of treatment for that patient. The next reality, which can be grim, is that mental illness can manifest in many different aspects of people's lives. Depression and suicide are such silent killers because often the symptoms aren't clear until they've manifested in a person's life, similar to a snake wrapping its, wrapping its coil around its prey. It starts with some small thoughts of, why should I go to class? Why do my friends hate me? What's so good about me? Until, fortunately, in some cases, you will feel the only release is death. Depression, along with other mental illnesses, are often misrepresented because it's not necessarily a feeling of sadness, but rather a feeling of nothing. If I were to describe my depression, I would put it as this. If I were told that I was going to be rich, for the rest of my life, I would react in the exact same way as if I was told I had a new chronic disease. It's not necessarily the feeling of sadness, but feeling nothing. More importantly, no, the last reality is that no one needs to have a reason to develop a mental illness, and it's not always important for us to figure out why that reason exists in terms of how did this happen? How exactly did this develop? Sometimes when you try to come up with a reason that equates why you should have a mental illness, you cause yourself more harm because you're just going through so many memories that you might get lost and you might not figure out what is actually happening. As the actor Eric Dane said on the Today Show, there does not need to be a reason for my depression. And I think that really suits well with this whole theme here. Lastly, that each mental illness in itself is unique, and that we need to give each person the respect that they deserve to clarify what they feel, what their symptoms are. I often find myself falling into the trap of, when I had this, don't, don't say that. Instead, say something along the lines of, I'm here for you, tell me what you feel comfortable saying. Although I may have described some bleak statistics about mental illness and some realities about it, I do ultimately believe that our societal attitudes about it are changing. Mental illness was not discussed in the press for years, and often when it was, sometimes people got it wrong. For example, even Oprah once said, if you're Simon Cowell, what do you have to be depressed about? And this is not her fault. At the time, it was more emblematic of a larger societal issue, how there was a universal, in some cases still is, lack of knowledge about mental health. But I would say, even based on my own personal experience, I would not have felt comfortable giving this talk a couple of years ago. But I think our societal attitudes are changing in some ways for the better, which in some parts of the world, not quickly enough. The last piece of information I want to leave you with is that so many people with mental illness struggle silently, not because they want to, but because they're afraid of the way how it will be perceived to family or friends. When you take that first step 
to talk to them or to try to change their perspective. You can not only change their perspective, but in a lot of cases, you can change their entire life for the better.